Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it's a blessing to you. So today we start a series called The Good Life. And in the picture, you probably saw that uh, it is kind of a play on that idea, the good life, right? It's, it's a, a beach and some sunglasses. This isn't the good life as the world says a good life is, um, although the picture might push us that direction. We just want to reel you in. Uh, but what it's talking about is a good life as it looks like in Scripture. Good, God creates everything and says it's good. It's right and righteous. So a good life is a righteous life, a life where we love Jesus and we live for him. Are excited for this. <laughs> that we love Jesus and we live for him. And what we're going to do in the series, The Good Life, is we're going to work through the book of Titus. It's a, it's a letter written by Paul to Titus. Um, it's very short. It's 46 verses long. You could read it like during a little break in your day. Uh, but it's powerful. It's a, what's called a pastoral epistle. It's a pastoral letter as Paul writes to Titus as he oversees churches on the island of Crete. Ever heard of the island of Crete? The island of Crete is southeast of Greece, southwest of Asia Minor, north of Africa and the Mediterranean Sea. Um, maybe you've just heard of Cretans before. That's where they're from. And that Titus, we'll find out in the next couple weeks, uh, specifically next week, um, was with Paul as Paul starts some churches on this island. And that Paul leaves him there to be in leadership over these new churches. That in all of these cities where they've started these uh, groups and gatherings of people that have put their faith in Jesus, that they need leadership and to be uh, taught what it looks like to live in accordance with following after Jesus. To live the good life, a righteous life, loving Jesus and following after him. Now that they've been saved, set free from sin, living on mission, on purpose, but on God's mission and God's purpose, not just that which is of ourself or of the world. And so what we'll do um, today is we're just going to get into four verses. And You might think when you hear that, oh man, I'm going to be back out in the sunshine in no time. Don't play yourself. We can make one verse last for hours. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. We're going to read through together Titus 1, 1 through 4, and then we're going to break it down together. There's massive power, massive impact in going straight through Scripture. One of the beauties of that is, and, and maybe you came up in a church that did that, and that's awesome. Um, I, I didn't necessarily come up in a church that did that as much. And one of the problems sometimes with not going through Scripture straight through is that we might cherry pick verses we like and skip over verses that are difficult. One of the beauties of going through books like this, and it's not the only way, we just went through a series before this that was topical. But one of the beauties of going through books of the Bible like this is we're forced to deal with hard things in Scripture and looking and considering the full counsel of God's Word. And so it, we deal with things uh, in ourselves that, that maybe um, if it's just up to us, we skip over. And so that's powerful. Also, it's not just dealing with ourselves, but we might be missing out on some powerful things that God has for us to benefit us and glorify Him when we just kind of bounce around in different places. And so... Uh, I've been blessed to be your pastor and with the oversight team kind of plan and think through how we preach as a church. And I was looking at it the other day. We've preached through lots of the books of the Bible. Um, even in our short span as a church, we've preached through Mark and Acts. And I'm going to forget the rest of them. Colossians, Ephesians. Um, we've preached through the Sermon on the Mount. We've preached through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We've preached through 1st uh, and 2nd Peter. 
um, many books. And so we're going to go now through Titus. This is the first time we've gone through one of the pastoral epistles where an apostle writes a letter to a pastor and teaches him what it looks like to lead and what it looks like for the people to follow after Jesus. So I'm excited for this. I think it's going to be beneficial for us. Um, and today we start here in Titus 1, 1 through 4. I intro long enough that if you have a Bible, you should be there now. If not, that's okay too. Let's read it first and then we'll break it down. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And which now, at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Sounds pretty basic. It's a welcome. It's a salutation. It's an introduction to what's going on here. Paul, uh, again, this is in like 62 to 64 AD. Paul's writing this letter to um, a young pastor, at least younger than him, it seems, who came to faith underneath his care, that, that now is leading underneath his care. He's a Greek. He's a Gentile. He's not one of the Jews that had been converted and put their faith in Christ. He's a Gentile that has put his faith in Christ. Paul's writing in this letter and I love the verbiage that we're going to get into today. Is he says, as a father to a true son in the common faith. I think that's going to be big for us as we look through this today. But if you're taking notes, go ahead and write down, by divine authority. The beginning of this intro, we'll see in verse 1, Paul introduces a little bit of who he is and why he has the right to speak with the authority that he'll write with. Um, and, and so here it is. The first part of verse 1 here, it says, Paul, if you don't know who Paul is, um, Paul was a persecutor of the early church, an enemy of Christ, who turned into this amazing and powerful apostle that has this experience with the risen King Jesus Christ that transforms him from one that is going after Christians, trying to smash out the church and, and go after anyone that calls Jesus Christ Lord. To have an experience with Christ that completely transforms him. And now he's the, the, the foremost in pushing forth the mission. Hmm. Expanding the kingdom. Founding churches. Preaching the gospel. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. A servant of God. You know, in some translations it says, a slave of God. In fact, it's probably a better translation. A slave of God. That Paul wants you to know that he's not his own. He considers himself bought at a price. That the cost has been paid through Christ Jesus. That he's no longer his, but he's on a mission that's greater than what he could come up with. That he's Paul, a servant of God. And that sounds a little nicer for us, but he's a slave of God. And that he's voluntarily become a slave. That he does what God tells him to as his master and Lord. Strong verbiage. A slave of God, and, he, and that verbiage is used in the Old Testament. He's in good company. It's, it's used of Abraham and Moses and David and Daniel are all called slaves of God. And an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle means several, several things. Kind of in a generic way, it means someone that's sent. It means a messenger. But in a, a title of authority, it, it means a witness of the risen King Jesus Christ. And that Paul speaks of the fact that he's an apostle differently than the other apostles. Because he didn't follow Jesus during his earthly ministry, but he had a revelation of Christ Jesus on the road to Damascus. And so he says, I'm a slave of God, but an apostle, an authoritative messenger of Jesus Christ. And, and that's a cool statement. That's a great way to start a line of, of a letter that's going to be read in the churches, that's going to be given to leaders, and specifically now is being given to the pastor of this area. That Paul wants you to know his writing is not just some guy somewhere 
with an idea. But that Paul says, I'm writing to you. I, I, I Paul, a slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm not even sent by somebody else. This isn't just stuff I've been told to tell you. This is what God has for you. There's power in the way that he introduces himself. In fact, when he introduces himself in the book of Galatians, he says it like this, and I think it's powerful to see what an apostle is or how he views himself as an apostle. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. It's important to Paul to have people know that I'm not just here because somebody told me to. You know, it's interesting. As we started the church, people would ask me, um, why did you start the church? In fact, people still ask me that, which is okay to ask. Why did you start the church? And some would ask me this, this comment, and it's because of some uh, church upbringing for them. Maybe they, you came up in a denomination where this is necessary. But they would ask, like, who's your covering? And the statement was actually built out of um, them wanting to know that I had somebody that had sent me. Can I just tell you, that's a question that, that Paul would respond with by saying, um, I didn't just do this because somebody told me to. I did this because God grabbed me and sent me on his mission and for his purpose. And I'm by no means equating myself to Paul. But my answer for people was, was pretty simple that way. That I couldn't shake the clarity of God speaking to my heart. That we were called to start this church. And it wasn't because somebody one day like came into a room with me and was like, hey, I want you to just go do this. And I had to be talked into it. But it was that God grabbed me and put me on this mission that Paul speaks with this authority and this clarity to say, I don't think of myself as something amazing. No, I I realize I'm under the authority of God. I'm his slave, and I'm sent by Jesus. It's not by my own doing or someone else's. By divine authority, this letter is being written. And then he's going to give us the purpose of the letter. Gives us why there's authority and why there's purpose. And I want us to consider in our own lives. Where do I find my purpose? What is my mission? What am I up to? And by whose authority am I on that mission or following out that purpose? It's something I think good for us to consider. But he'll go on here and say who he is and then what he's up to. Watch this. To further the faith. Paul, a servant of God, apostle of Jesus Christ. To further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. This is so cool. That Paul realizes that he's been commissioned out of this great authority to push forth the faith of God's people and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And in that, watch this, in the furthering of faith, Of God's elect. He's saying, for those God calls to himself, that God saves, that he brings from death to life, I want to further that faith. I want to establish it. And it doesn't matter where they're at right now, whether they've put their faith in God yet, or maybe they've walked this out for a while. He wants to further that faith. It's a cool line. And he wants that faith to be founded in a proper understanding, a correct understanding of the truth that would lead to godliness. That faith is based in correct truth, and that it leads to godliness. Hmm. He believes in a faith that is transformative, and that the faith that would be transformative, <laughs> transformative would be one that would be firmly founded on the actual truth of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us, and what it looks like in following after him. Hmm. Paul. A servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of truth that leads to godliness. Let's look at this for a couple more minutes. To move the faith forward of God's people. You know, on a personal level, it's really good to understand, and we, we've talked about this recently, where somebody's at in front of you. The goal isn't always to get them from 1 to 10. If you can get somebody from 1 to to two. That's oftentimes a big step. 
that it takes lots of people often and, and, and many experiences as we grow and are sanctified and understand more and are being perfected to look like Jesus. And that some plant and some water, right? And that all of us should be helping each other to further our faith. And that Paul says, I further the faith of God's elect, God's people. I want to move them forward in the faith. And I love this in Romans 10, 17, and I, I quote it often. It talks about where faith comes from. If we were to move people forward in faith, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. That he wants to move people's faith forward. It's not just some sort of like, well, just get it together and try harder. But instead, it's him delivering the message, the word about Jesus Christ, and that that would be what is transformative as they understand, have a knowledge of truth that it would further people's faith. I hope that every time I get to preach, every time you meet in a group, every time you open the word, every time you pray, that your faith would be moved forward. Further the faith in the knowledge of the truth. Jesus says, John 17, 17. He's praying for his disciples. He says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Both of these are awesome. He's showing us very clearly. He says, I want people to grow, and I want that growth to lead to godliness. It's pointing back to the way that that happens is by an understanding of who God is, what he has done on our behalf, and how that should transform our lives. You guys are really excited this morning. <laughs> and that it's not just some sort of external motivation or popular thought in worldly culture, culture and psychology, but it's the strength and power of God's breathed word that is alive and active, that is sharper than a double-edged sword, that does a work inside of us when we open it up, when we hear it proclaimed. As we get before God in prayer, as he does a work in us, by the presence of his spirit. Further the faith and the knowledge of truth. And, and Paul believes all through scripture, although he believes that we are saved by grace, through faith. As we believe in Christ Jesus, it's not out of our works, but it's through grace and faith that we're saved. He also believes in a, a gospel that is powerful enough to transform our works. That it is a gospel that leads to godliness. Hmm. The gospel leads to godliness. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, it says this about godliness. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. It's actually the next point. Pretend like that's not there. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Hmm. It's so good, and it's not easy. God is holy. We're called to be holy as he is holy. As he has saved us, purified us, forgiven us of all of our sins, made us right and righteous through Christ Jesus, and called us to live out a life in accordance with who we are now are. And do we nail it all the time? I wish. I can't wait. I can't wait. God, please keep doing a work in me. And in that, let us learn to be quick to repent, quick to confess, quick to move forward. As God would use those moments, even in our failing, to purify us. To bring us back to the foot of the cross. To remind us how, how great he is and what he saved us from and saved us to. That Paul is under this divine authority. He has a great purpose to further the faith of God's people, their knowledge of the truth that would lead to godliness. And that it would all be done in great hope. Check this out. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. We'll get to that in just a second. In the hope of eternal life. That if we have a clear understanding that life is eternal. That we either receive the due punishment for our sins. Or we receive through Christ Jesus forgiveness and right standing with God. 
and that there's this hope of eternal life. And sometimes I think we, we don't really grasp that eternal life starts now. When we put our faith in Jesus, yes, it is something that is completely, we'll understand more that day when we stand before him. After either he returns or we die and we understand what eternal life looks like in that way. But, but eternal life is found in Jesus Christ as we put our faith in him. The eternal life is not just quantity of life that is after we die, but it's quality of life even as it begins today. Hear that. The hope of eternal life. Yes, as it goes forever, but that it's already been given to us in Jesus Christ. That we start walking out eternal life now because we are already in right relationship with God. Already able to talk to God through prayer and understand him through a revelation of who Christ Jesus is. Be filled with the Spirit. As he works in us to transform us even now. We don't just wait for that day only. Today I ask that God would do a work in me. That I would live a full life. Hmm. A life of not just quantity but quality. In John 10.10, Jesus says this, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That we would have the fullness of life. The fullness of life. Again, let me explain to you that that is not by worldly definition. Often when we hear that, what we go is, oh, well then if I'm supposed to have a full life, then... I should have this, 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 this. And, and most often it's things. We think of filling our life, not having a full life. That a full life is fully filled. It's fulfillment. And fulfillment only comes from being what we've been created to be. In right relationship with God through Christ. Walking out the purposes and missions that he has put us on. For his glory and our greatest joy. And we wrestle through, God, today am I walking that out? And it's good that every day, God, let my life fully glorify you. My thoughts, my motives, my actions, my words. Not just so that I could check off the religious boxes or, or impress those that are around me by putting on a false self. But God, let me genuinely be transformed to shine your light to the world. And enjoy what it looks like to follow after Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that everything is easy. Because this world is broken. But that even through broken times, I would be fulfilled because I'm found in you. You know it to be true. You've seen people that, that understand what it's like to have a good life. And it's not based on all the peripheral things. In fact, many people that we envy because of their stuff are empty and I'm not saying if you have stuff you're definitely empty there's also people that have stuff and aren't empty but I've met equally as many people that seem to have nothing but when you talk to them clearly they have everything but they're more fulfilled it's because they have a peace and a joy and an identity and a value and a stability and have received love and forgiveness. And all of it is found in Jesus. And that they're walking that out. And so they're, they're not dependent on everything else to have a good life. But they walk in the life that's been given to them, a life that is full. And is lived to the fullest with God. The hope of eternal life. Also, there is that life that we are promised. It's not that I'm saying there isn't the quantity of life that we live forever in God's presence, which we should long for, be excited for, be expectant of, and understand that God has promised by the deposit of his spirit in our lives. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. How cool is that? That God has not only given us this promise that we have eternal life with him, he's also given us the deposit so that we're, we're not by ourselves just hoping in that promise. Although his word should be enough, he's also given us his spirit that would prove to us again that that promise is, is real and will be fulfilled, that our confidence is in God continuing the work and being faithful to his own word. That Paul comes with his authority, with clear purpose, to further the faith that would be found in, in great hope of eternal life. And he'll talk about the, when it was promised and when it's delivered, that it's promised then and delivered now. Check this out. In Titus 1, 2, the second part of it says this. And the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. Mm. So good. Should we really have to be told that God doesn't lie? No, but he just wanted to add that in. Just in case there was confusion amongst the people that would hear. Which God, who does not lie, saying God is faithful. So what he promised happens. He does not lie. He promised before the beginning of time. That it was promised then and it's delivered now. In, in Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, it says this about this great promise. This is so cool. For he chose in him before the creation of the world. Excuse me. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. That God decided this plan, that mankind would be saved through Christ Jesus. Jesus would come, be born of a virgin, live a perfect, righteous life, never sinning, unlike all of us. Living the perfect righteous life that we're all called to live. Dying on the cross in our place. As a substitute. Taking all of our sins upon him, himself. And giving all of his righteous, righteousness to us as we put our faith in him. That our sins and the consequences of them. The shame, the guilt. The consequence is taken on Jesus. And that we are free and made righteous and right and whole and holy just by looking to Christ Jesus and putting our faith in him. Praise God. That on the third day he is raised from the grave, showing his power over sin and death. Ascends into heaven and sits on the throne. And that that was part of God's plan from the beginning. That he had called that those that would be saved would be those that put their faith in Jesus Christ. And it's always been the plan. Hmm. Promised then and delivered now. Check this out. The rest of that verse. And Titus says, and which, or the next verse. And which now has been a pointed season he has brought to light. And which now at his appointed season he has brought to light. You know in the ESV it says... Instead of brought to light, it says manifested his word. I'm so glad we live in like New Testament time. In the Old Testament, there's this great presence of God. There's amazing things that happen. But they were always looking forward to a promise of a Savior. But that now we have the fulfilled promise in Christ Jesus. Who has already finished the work. It is finished forgiveness of our sins, and the giving of eternal life as we put our faith in him, in which now at his appointed season he has brought to light or manifested his word, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that God promised it before the beginning of time, and fulfilled it in Christ Jesus, that all of his promises are yes and amen in Jesus. In 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6, it says it like this, for there is one God 
and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed at the proper time. What an awesome day we live in. A day where when we put our faith in Jesus, God has promised that his spirit comes to live inside of us. That the spirit of the most high God, the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, indwells all of those that put their faith in him. That the, the work of salvation has already been done. Now we're being sanctified to look like Jesus until the day that he returns. What an awesome thing that we look back and, and have a, a, a proclamation. And we preach the truth of Jesus Christ and him crucified. At the proper time, in great hope, promised then, delivered now through preaching. Look at the rest of verse 3. And which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. There's a couple cool things here. One, it says through the preaching. We'll get to that in just a second. Entrusted to me sounds like it's just handed to you. But right here it says by the command of God our Savior. It's an interesting dynamic. It's been entrusted to me. God's given me something great. He's trusted me with the most precious thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's done so with great authority. He commanded me to do it. He trusted me with it and commanded me to do it. That now, that eternal promise of, of eternal life, that hope that we have, the furthering of the faith, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in, etern- or in hope of eternal life, It was promised then, delivered now through the preaching of the word. Entrusted to us. That God decided to push forth the truth through broken people. The perfect message through imperfect people. And that's both amazing and daunting. That's real. We have something so precious inside of something so broken. And so fragile. But that God found fit to call us on his mission, to allow us to be a part of his great plan in full dependence of him, reliance on him for strength, courage, boldness, and the right words to say. Hmm. God brings forth faith in people and the furthering of faith through the delivery of his word that's been entrusted to Paul and to us. By the command and commissioning of God our Savior. I love in in 1 Corinthians, check that, 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. The power of preaching to awaken faith inside of someone. To push forward the faith inside. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry... We do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, It is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. 
that we are all called to preach the word of God. And some of us in different roles and in different fashions with different pulpits, but all of us called to preach. All of us called to the ministry of reconciliation. That we would proclaim that God would not hold man's sin, to get, sin against them, but would save them through Jesus Christ. All people that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is such a great verse that, that all of us are called to that and what great hope we have in several things. Listen, it's freeing because it says those that don't believe, it's not just on you. It's that they're blinded and, and currently weren't able to put their faith in Jesus when you proclaimed him. So it's free knowing that I can't save anybody. If I thought that I could save somebody, how big-headed could I be or you be potentially? And how devastated would we be when someone doesn't put their faith in Jesus? As if I was sending them to hell or I was saving them. But that instead we would preach the word of God knowing that it has the power to transform. Knowing that as is spoken in the verses we just read, as God said, let there be light, he does that inside of hearts. Through the preaching of the word that he would awaken and bring to life dead spaces. So that even those that currently it seems veiled to them that they wouldn't understand, we would continue to preach the gospel to all people knowing that it has the power to save. As it has for all of us that have put our faith in Jesus. And I love the last verse that we carry this amazing and powerful message in jars of clay. Look at this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. That we would constantly remember and, and, and fight against pride, but in all humility we would deliver the most powerful message that there is to share. I'm going to mess this quote up, but I read it this week and I loved it. So I apologize. Hopefully it still has the kick when I mess it up. I heard a quote that said, Certainly there are those that preach the good news more powerfully, but there are, <laughs> no one preaches a more powerful good news. Certainly there are those that deliver the message more powerfully. Hmm. How freeing is that? But no one delivers a more powerful message. There is no greater message that has the ability to save and transform. And that all of us Declare that message not because we're perfect or have it all together or more special than anybody else. We do so in great humility, realizing that God would deliver a perfect message through imperfect people. And that we would go forth anyways in hopes that he would work through us to save. Through the preaching, we're made spiritual family. Look at this. To Titus. My true son in our common faith. Paul is a Jew. Titus is a Gentile. It's not his actual son. It's his true son in the common faith. He has that same verbiage for Timothy. And what happens is in scripture we see Jesus say, go and make disciples of all nations. As the gospel was going out among Jewish people, they would continue to use that verbiage. Go and make disciples. Make disciples as a rabbi with a disciple, as a teacher with their student. Go and have these students teach them what it looks like to put their faith in Jesus and follow after him. As the message got further and further out, not everybody had the same structures in their culture that had rabbis and disciples. And so the verbiage started to change into a way that everybody would understand. And instead of rabbi and disciple, they started saying a spiritual father and spiritual son. Spiritual parents and spiritual children. And so that, think of the responsibility they carried. They said, if you put your faith in Jesus underneath my preaching, I now see you as one of my own children and I have a responsibility to raise you up. 
So he writes to Titus as a true son, as this, this great care for him, as a son in the faith. When you think about your own children, you'd probably do anything for them. What about those that God has called you to raise up in the faith? And I want you to wrestle through that. Do I have people that are sons and daughters in the faith that, that I'm raising up to follow after him? And sometimes we wait too long, like we want to be completely perfect, have it all figured out before we start declaring the gospel or raising people up to follow after him. I just have some news for you. You'll never do it if that's the case. The good news is you're not the answer. You're not the savior. You're the jar of clay. Is continuing to point people to the Savior. And so for all of us, we should think through who are those people that we should be, could be, can be, will start to raise up in the faith. Hmm. And for many of us, do I have a father or a mother in the faith that would help me be raised up? That would help to guide and coach and, and bring me up in the way of following after Jesus. And if not, I want you to, to look for that and find that on both sides. That you would be being discipled and that you would disciple others. It's a good question for all of us to work through. Spiritual family. And then lastly, saved by God. And can I get the worship team to come up? The last part of verse 4 here says, Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. This is so good. It's, it's a pretty regular part of introductions and even when they're saying goodbye. Grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is kind of cool. Check this out. The verse before says, God the Savior. And this one says, Jesus, our Savior. And so you might wrestle through, well, which one is he? Yes. The answer is yes. God, our Savior. Jesus, our Savior. God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit. That by the Father's will we are saved, that Christ Jesus did what he did. And by the work of Jesus Christ, that the Father is God, that Jesus is God, that the Spirit is God. And I love that it says that a reminder that God's the one that saves us. He's our Savior. Remember that. It's not, I'm the Savior. Many of us might say Jesus is our Savior, but our, our thought process is actually... I attained some sort of knowledge that I was able to save myself by doing something. Even if it's by, I was able to save myself by putting my faith somewhere. And really it points back to me and being good enough to save myself. It doesn't say you, your Savior. It says Jesus, our Savior. 2 Timothy 1, 9 through 10 says this. He has saved us. He has saved us. And called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That our hope is not in us figuring it out, but our hope is in the one that established it and has it all figured out. That we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus. And that a good life is a righteous life, is a life following after. Following in the, in the pathway of how God has made us to thrive in human existence, in relationship with Him and with others. In right standing with Him and each other. That we would, he would work those things out in us and through us. And our quantity of life and quality of life would be better as Christ Jesus is king. His way is the best way. 
and he is faithful. His word is true. I'm excited to get through this. Thank you for allowing me to break down four verses in such a time this morning. What I'd love for us to do is just, if you could stand to your feet. We're going to sing a song of how awesome God is. Praise him. And we just go into this time of response where if you need prayer for anything, we believe in the power of prayer because of the one that we pray to. He's more powerful than anything that is coming against us. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you if, if you'd like prayer for anything. Um, we're going to sing. I'd love for you to consider what God might be doing in your heart, might be asking of you as a next step. And connecting to God and connecting to church. If you have questions uh, about the church or how to get involved, and maybe, you know, I put my faith in Jesus, but I don't feel like I'm being discipled. How can that happen? I want to encourage you to go to the Connect Center out in the lobby where they'll help you figure out that journey and get connected to people to do so. Um, I also want to just, before I pray and get off the stage, just remind you, for those of you that have mothers in your life, maybe even if they're not your own, let today be a day that you celebrate them. Thank God for them. And make much of them today that they would feel special in that way. So, God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for your presence that is here with us as we praise your name and open your word. God, I pray that you would be doing a work. And God, I don't pretend to know all that you're up to. in relationships, in provisional ways. God, I pray that you would use today to draw people closer to yourself that would further our faith, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness as we have hope of eternal life that has been given now in Christ Jesus. God, we love you. We thank you for all of this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I love you. Let's sing together.